Greetings, church family. We want to continue our reflections on God as our shepherd uh, this this week and reflect on the way that he cares for us. Uh, one of the ways that we can see that is by looking through the Old Testament and seeing how Yahweh, the God of Israel, was uh, the shepherd of the people of Israel, the nation of Israel as a whole. Uh, so Yahweh, the God of Israel, was Israel's shepherd. Uh, pointed to in many passages in the Old Testament. And I've pulled together eight ways that uh, Yahweh is said to shepherd his people, Israel. And in all of those ways, uh, ultimately, we see them pointing forward to the way that God, through Jesus, shepherds us as the church, uh, as the people of God, relating to him by the terms of the new covenant. Uh, and we see some ways that the New Testament writers draw on those Old Testament scripture that talked about uh, Yahweh as Israel's shepherd to point forward to Jesus as the shepherd of us, of believers in Jesus, followers of Jesus, his sheep, uh, his flock as the church. And so I want to tie some of those threads together as we work through uh, this concept. We'll look at several passages of scripture. And so if you've got a Bible handy, uh, you could open and try to flip with me uh, as I run through some of these passages pretty quickly. But eight ways that, that Yahweh, the Lord, the God of Israel, shepherds, uh, shepherded the nation of Israel under the Old Covenant that point forward to the ways that Jesus shepherds us today. Uh, so first of, all, first of all, we can see Yahweh uh, leading his people, Israel. Psalm 80 verse 1 points to this. It says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. And so the psalmist there is praying to the shepherd of Israel and uh, commenting on how he leads Joseph like a flock. He leads the nation like a flock of sheep. Uh, Jesus picks up this role of leadership. We saw it uh, in uh, Yahweh's shepherding of Jacob, and we, shot, we saw it in Yahweh's shepherding of David, uh, even in Pastor Ken's uh, look at Psalm 23 yesterday. And so it was true for the nation of Israel as a whole. And so it is that Jesus uh, fulfills that role for his sheep, for us. Today. He leads us. He leads his people. John 10, 3 and 4, where Jesus identifies himself as the good shepherd. Uh, he says, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. And so the shepherd leads us out uh, into the world uh, to follow him wherever he leads, by his word, by his voice. And so just as Yahweh led the people of Israel in the Old Testament period, so it is that Jesus leads us now, uh, day by day, throughout our lives. A second way that we see Yahweh shepherding the people of Israel in the Old Testament is that he carried his people. Uh, perhaps this is a, a very vivid image that comes to mind when you think of an ancient shepherd carrying sheep some of the artistic depictions of shepherds in the ancient world, or even as Jesus, uh, depictions of Jesus as a shepherd, picture him carrying uh, sheep or lambs on his shoulders. And this is very much a biblical image. Uh, Psalm 28 refers to this. Psalm 28, 9, David writes, O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. We'll see in just a moment how Jesus uh, is described uh, that way as well, or Jesus refers to himself that way, but it comes together with another way that God, Yahweh, shepherded the people of Israel in the way that Jesus shepherds us as well. Uh, so in conjunction with him carrying his people, uh, and I would see that as, as God not only leading us by walking out in front of us, but actually taking us where we need to go, ensuring that we get where he wants us to be. Uh, but before he carries us, he has to find us. And that's the third way that we look at the biblical depiction of God as the shepherd of his people, Yahweh as the shepherd of Israel, and Jesus as the shepherd of us. He finds his people. Uh, Ezekiel 34 
which is a passage that kind of weaves back and forth between a depiction of God as the shepherd of Israel and a prophetic foreshadowing of another figure who would come later, who would be the shepherd of his sheep ultimately. And we'll look more at that in tomorrow's uh, devotional. But Ezekiel 34 verses 11 and 12 says this, Behold, I, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And of course, Ezekiel the prophet is addressing the people of Israel in exile under the judgment of God for their rebellion against him. Uh, to keep the sheep metaphor uh, in place, this is the judgment that has fallen on the sheep because of their wandering, because they have abandoned their shepherd to seek after other pasture land and to seek after other shepherds who would provide for them uh, not nearly as well as Yahweh would. And so Yahweh is announcing a day when he's going to re restore them from exile. He's going to bring them back into his sheepfold. And of course, Jesus is the one who fulfills that image. And he tells us about this and he brings out that image of finding the sheep in the famous parable of the lost sheep in Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 verses 3 through 6, the very famous uh, parable where Jesus tells a story about a shepherd who had uh, a hundred sheep and 99 of them are safe and secure in the sheepfold but one has wandered off and the shepherd himself goes out to find it, seeks it until he finds it. Uh, and so Jesus says that he'll, he'll go after the one that is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. So that's that image of the shepherd carrying the sheep that we saw previously uh, of the people of Israel and also of us. Once he finds us, he puts us on his shoulders and he carries us so that he ensures that we make it to our destination. How encouraging for difficult times when we feel like we're prone to wander, when we feel like we're pushed or pressured by uh, external forces like this virus and the social isolation that we're not enjoying all that much, uh, we, we find ourselves squeezed and pressed by this. But the truth of the matter is that even in the midst of this difficulty, our shepherd is carrying us and he's going to make sure that we get to where he wants us to go. Another way that we see Yahweh shepherding his people Israel in the Old Testament is that he restores his people. This was a line that we saw in uh, Psalm 23, um, the way that um, David spoke of Yahweh as restoring his soul or restoring his life. Uh, and Psalm 80 picks up on that. And there's a refrain in Psalm 80. We've already seen Psalm 80 verse 1. And uh, psalm 80, verse 3, verse 7, and verse 19 repeat a refrain within that psalm, and it goes like this. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. And in the context of Psalm 80, with it starting off uh, with that prayer in verse 1 where the psalmist is calling out to God as the shepherd of Israel, this language of restoring is the language of shepherding. But what's really interesting about this Hebrew term is that it is also the language of repentance. In Hebrew, it is a, a form of this verb that means to cause something to happen. And so what we see is that uh, God is being called on to cause the people, to empower the people, to enable the people to return, to be restored, to repent even. And so the psalmist is begging on behalf of the people of Israel, begging for God to enable them to turn back to God himself, to be restored, to repent, to turn back to God in faithfulness. And so this picture of being enabled to repent, to be returned back to the sheepfold, back to a proper relationship with God, that's what the psalmist is hoping for, for Israel, uh, in their rebellion, in their, probably in their exile, as they sit under the judgment of God. The prayer is that God would enable them to repent because by themselves they can't. 
They need God to grant repentance. And of course, that language is repeated in the New Testament. We see the fulfillment of that prayer, the answer to that prayer coming in Jesus in the New Testament, in the New Covenant for the people of Israel and also for the Gentiles. Together, the hopes of the restoration of Israel in the prophets and in the Psalms that we see here in Psalm 80 was always not just for the Jewish people, but that when the Jewish people are restored to faithfulness to God by trusting in their Messiah, in their true shepherd, the Gentiles would come along also to join them. And that's exactly what we see happening in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 5, verse 31, we read, God exalted him, Jesus, at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Later in the book of Acts, we see the same kind of language used of the Gentiles. After Peter has his famous vision about the, the sheet with all of the unclean animals on it, where God teaches him finally that uh, the Gentiles must be accepted as full members of the people of God. Um, and the people finally embrace that reality in Acts chapter 11, verse 18, after hearing Peter report this vision and his encounter with Cornelius. And they all say, then to the Gentiles also, also, in addition to Israel, God has granted repentance that leads to life, given as a gift repentance. The ability to return to God, the ability to turn away from our sin and turn to God in faith is a gift of God's grace. And we see that particularly in the role of shepherding. It is the shepherd's role to restore the sheep to their proper place, to their proper position in the sheepfold. And that is a picture of the salvation that God provides in Jesus Christ that includes faith in him, trusting him for what he's done for us in his death and resurrection, and also turning away from our sins in repentance. Well, another way that we see Yahweh shepherding his people Israel in the Old Testament is back again to that prophetic text in Ezekiel 34, which we'll look at more tomorrow. Uh, we see Yahweh feeding his people. A fundamental role of a shepherd in the ancient world was to be sure that his sheep were eating the proper food, eating good food, nourishing food, refreshing food. And so Yahweh feeds his people. Ezekiel 34 verses 13 to 16 says it like this. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them with good pasture and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares Lord Yahweh. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak and fat and the strong. The fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. Now we see this fulfilled in the person of Jesus, the good shepherd who provides pasture for his sheep. And it's interesting how when Jesus is teaching about himself as the good shepherd, he gravitates back and forth between identifying himself as the shepherd and also he's the very door or the gate for the sheep. John 10, 9, I am the door or the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And so Jesus is the one who provides this good grazing land that Yahweh himself promised to his people who were in exile in Babylon. They needed to return to the land, literally and physically, but more than that, they needed to return to a relationship with God. And that happened in two stages. It happens finally and ultimately as Jewish people turn to Jesus and trust in Jesus as their true shepherd, and they begin feeding on the good pasture land that Jesus himself is and that he provides for his people together. 
And so that's one another way that we see that unfolding in uh, Ezekiel 34 and then being fulfilled in Jesus in John chapter 10. A sixth way we see Yahweh shepherding the nation of Israel and ultimately coming across to Jesus, shepherding his people uh, now and into the future, is that Yahweh rules his people. Now, that's another thing that we haven't mentioned yet, but that needs to be borne in mind when we think about this imagery of shepherding. In the ancient world, uh, everywhere, not just in Israel, not just in the Bible, but everywhere in the ancient world, Shepherding was a consistent metaphor for rulers. A good king was a good shepherd. And that is true in the scriptures as well as in the ancient world more generally. If someone wanted uh, to talk, talk about what was, it, what was an ideal king to be like, they were to be like a shepherd. Kings were to rule their people the way that a good shepherd would care for his sheep. And so... Uh, Pastor Ken mentioned this, kind of alluded to it in passing in the midst of his exploration of Psalm 23, but that's exactly what's being depicted there as David recognizes that Yahweh is his shepherd king. And so it is for the people of Israel. Yahweh is their true king. He is their true shepherd. And so when you see shepherding imagery in the Bible, what it's really talking about is the kingship, the sovereignty, the rule of God over his people, the loving, caring, supportive rule of the good king, Yahweh. We see this uh, combined and, and fleshed out for us in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 10 and 11. Behold, Lord Yahweh comes with might, and his arm rules for him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. That is a description, a metaphorical description of the rule of Yahweh. How does the sovereign Lord rule over his people? Like a shepherd, lovingly, gently leading and caring for his weak, fragile people. Now that gets fulfilled in the person of Jesus as he comes as the human king who is also fully divine, the human divine good shepherd. And the way that we see this fleshed out specifically is in Revelation chapter 12. Uh, there's some discussion about Revelation 12, the vision of the great red dragon and the woman who gives birth to the man-child and what that all means. My own perspective of that is quite simple, that John is seeing a vision of the birth of Jesus, something that happened before John's time, uh, obviously. And we're seeing an image there of the significance of that moment, of how uh, the, the, the king, the true king, came into the world. The Messiah came into the world, born of a virgin. And he was protected by God throughout his life until he ultimately culminated in his death and resurrection and then his ascension where he was taken up to God. And that, that whole story of Jesus is compressed in this vision. But the key line for our purposes is Revelation 12, 5, where the woman's given birth to the male child and he is described as one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But... That Greek word that's translated rule there is normally translated shepherd. Most of your English Bibles will have a footnote that'll tell you that. To shepherd all the nations with a rod, one of the shepherd's tools, right? Uh, a rod of iron. And that is the fulfillment of this picture that Isaiah 40 was talking about on behalf of the people of Israel. And so the rule of God comes into play in the shepherding of all the nations, not just Israel, but all the nations uh, in Jesus himself. He is the true king of kings and the shepherd of shepherds. A seventh way that we see uh, this picture being fleshed out is that, and I'm kind of combining two into one here, but Yahweh gathers and guards his people. Uh, this is a big one for me, as I talked about uh, a couple of days ago, but the protection of Yahweh, of his people, is so precious a promise to me. And it's depicted in shepherding terms, but it's combined with this idea of him gathering his people together in their sheep pen to keep them safe. He gathers and he guards. 
Jeremiah 31, which is connected to a prophecy about the coming of the new covenant in the Messiah. Jeremiah 31.10 says this, He who scattered Israel, so God who judged Israel and scattered them to the nations in exile, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. Micah, the prophet Micah, prophesying earlier than Jeremiah, said something uh, similar. Uh, Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah earlier than Jeremiah, and Micah 2.12 says this, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. What a picture. And I believe that that is being fulfilled and that is fulfilled in Jesus gathering his people, Jewish and Gentile, all together in the one flock. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 10. John 10, 16. Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And I believe there he's talking about Gentiles that are outside the fold of Israel that need to be brought into the fold of Israel. And he is the one who does it. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd, as the prophet said. We'll look more at that tomorrow. And so Jesus is the one shepherd who is gathering together into one flock. The people of Israel, who were under the judgment of God, scattered in exile, um, and uh, Gentiles as well that are being brought in. And if you go one chapter forward in John's Gospel, this language of gathering into one is made even more explicit, and it's connected specifically to Jesus' death, that this is what he's doing. John eleven fifty one. 51, it's kind of an interesting passage where Caiaphas, the Jewish high priest who is plotting to murder Jesus, gives a spirit-inspired prophecy in his role as high priest of Israel. He didn't know he was doing that, but he was. And John explains it to us. John 11, 51. Caiaphas prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. The same language that uh, that uh, Jeremiah 31 was using. And so it seems clear to me there that, that Caiaphas was giving a prophecy about the new covenant being established in the death of Jesus that would accomplish the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31.10, that the flock of God would be gathered together in conjunction with the establishment of the new covenant in the death of Jesus. Caiaphas didn't know that, and once he saw it unfolding before his eyes, he couldn't see the significance of that, and he rejected it. But he gathers us to guard us, as Jeremiah 31 talked about. And I shared with you one of the promises that's so precious to me about God's protecting of his people. And it's become even more precious to me in in days where uh, normalcy, at least, is threatened. And health is threatened. And life is threatened for some. Talk to any of these folks who in our who are in our body who have suffered from COVID-19, and I think they will tell you uh, how their body has been broken and how scary it was for them. And it's in moments like those where we really need to have confidence in our shepherd, that he is protecting and guarding us even though our body is breaking down and falling apart. One of the most wonderful promises of that kind of protection for me is 1 John 5.18. It's one of my favorite verses. Uh, John writes, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, does not make a practice of sinning. Sin doesn't dominate and characterize the life of one who's been born again, one who's been born of God. But, John goes on, he who was born of God He who was born of God, and I think there he's talking about Jesus specifically, he who was born of God uniquely, specially in the the miraculous conception of Jesus the Messiah. He who was born of God protects him. And that's a present tense verb emphasizing the ongoing, constant, continuous reality that Jesus is protecting everyone 
who has been born of God. All the children of God are moment by moment, day by day, being protected by Jesus himself. And then he gives the result of that. Because that's true, because Jesus, the good shepherd, is committed to protecting you and committed to protecting me, John says, the evil one does not touch him. The devil, Satan, the evil one, does not touch a true child of God. He cannot because Jesus is committed to protecting you. That is so mind-blowing and comforting. We give the devil way too much credit when things are so hard for us. And, and I've seen too much of it in the, in the Christian media out there lately on social media and out on websites and the internet talking about how the devil is using this virus and all of these things and, and how he's inflicting this virus on God's people. No, that is not what's happening. God himself, Jesus himself, is committed to protecting us from the devil so that he cannot touch us. Now, Yes, the devil is our enemy. Yes, he does range all of his forces against God's people. But he cannot actually harm us. Jesus is committed to protect us. And if Jesus is committed to protect us, then what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? Finally, number eight, Yahweh judges his people as shepherd. It's interesting that the shepherding metaphor gets used and applies to, applied to judgment, but it makes sense when you think about the nature of a sheepfold and how sometimes it's not just sheep who are mixed into the pen. Ezekiel 34, again, speaks to this. Ezekiel 34, 17, Behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. So there's a, it's God himself, the shepherd alone, oftentimes, who can tell the difference between true sheep and goats, or even wolves in sheep's clothing. He goes on later in that passage, Ezekiel 34, 20 to 22, and he says, Behold, I, I myself, will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. So there, Yahweh is depicting the reality, the reality that I believe we're facing even today that shows us that the, the church, the flock of God, has false sheep in it, sheep who are deceived, sheep who think they're sheep and they're really not, but also wolves in sheep's clothing. And sometimes, as I said earlier, it is, it's impossible for us to discern the difference, but God knows God knows, and he is the one who will bring judgment. In the book of Revelation, again, this picture gets broadened out, and we see again the fulfillment of this in the judging role of the shepherd, Jesus, the shepherd who is the lamb. So Revelation 7:17. 7, the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Interesting how that imagery gets shifted in the book of Revelation. The lamb becomes the shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes who are the sheep in this image the sheep here in Revelation chapter 7 is the great multitude that no one could number from every nation clothed in white robes who have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb who is their shepherd just a few verses earlier than this, in Revelation 6, 16, John described this image of the wrath of the Lamb, who is the shepherd. And so it's the judgment of the shepherd, the wrath of the Lamb that's being poured out against those who reject his shepherding care, those who reject his rightful rule, those who refuse to join up with the sheep. You see, you can become a sheep. If you're not a sheep, you can become a sheep simply by heeding the voice of the shepherd. He has done the work required to change you from a goat to a sheep. The work that was required was 
living a perfectly obedient life in submission to Yahweh, the God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the ultimate shepherd over all. He lived his life in perfect submission to that shepherd. And he died offering himself as this Lamb of God a spotless lamb of God as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of goats. And ultimately, it's that death, that sacrifice who can change us from being goats who are rebellious and hostile against God and can enter the sheepfold and experience all of these wonderful things that we've been talking about, all of this great comfort that comes from reflecting on the image of Jesus as our shepherd. You can only experience that if you're a sheep. And so I urge you, I implore you, if you don't know yourself to be a sheep, if you don't acknowledge yourself to be needy of this shepherd and the salvation that he offers, I plead with you, turn your life over to him. Yield to him. Enter the sheepfold by the gate. The way is Jesus. The shepherd is Jesus. Come to him, go to him, enter through him, and enjoy the protection, the preservation, and the rich pasture land and provision that our shepherd gives to us. He rose from the dead victorious over all of our enemies, so he has the power to keep us all the way to the end. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for giving us such a shepherd. Thank you for embodying your shepherding care in flesh and blood. Thank you for providing the shepherd who would also be the lamb to sacrifice himself, to pay for our failures, to pay for our wandering, for, to pay for our very sheepness. Oh, Father, thank you for the care that you provide for us. Would you comfort my brothers and sisters, provide the protection that you promise, continue to nourish us through your word, through your presence with us, Lead us to the good green pastures. Lead us beside the still waters that bring peace and rest in the midst of a time of uncertainty and unclarity. Let us trust you with all that we have and all that we are. In the name of our good shepherd, we pray.